So welcome everybody. Um, my name is John Foster Bedley. I'm the Dean and Director of Henry Business School in Africa. I know some of you. I'm afraid I haven't had a chance to go through all the, the list of people there. So I really hope I'll be able to um, catch up with some as we go. Um, I will try and keep an eye on the questions and chats as we go, but I've also got a few things to, to cover. So I'm going to just rearrange my screen. I've got three screens here. One with my questions and chat in there, if I can get it up there. And there's the chat. I'll try and put that over there and I'll just get on with it. So, you know, like you, I've been bewildered in some ways by this year, last year, and what's happened. And, you know, we thought it was pretty bewildering and whatever before the pandemic came along. But when, when we had to change our world in this way, I think, um, I think, I mean, we've all had to go through some very tough times, actually. Um, but I think that in some cases, um, it's been very tough indeed. Um, and I think for all of us, we've had to rethink about that thing that we call work um, and our lives. And maybe, maybe in this awful kind of maelstrom and fear sometimes we're living in, there are the seeds of some really interesting stuff. And maybe this is, maybe we can make this a moment where we really grow and start to do the things that we thought were impossible. You know, we know the world is a hectic place in some, uh, at, at the best of times, but we're seeing some of the things that a lot of us took for granted unpacking. But I think we have to look for the things that are really interesting, those small shoots of the new future that are around us. We need to keep an eye open for those. So I'm gonna to present to you my five thoughts for um, the future, if I can get this to change, I wonder how this is going. Um, can somebody put in a chat whether they can see the change slides? Can you just say, if you did the child, did the slide change? Just somebody put it in there, say yes or no or something. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Wow, okay. Thank you. Well, that means it's working. So the first thing is, and I'm gonna go through these one by one, is I think we need to make reality our friends and get off autopilot. And I'm going to come to that in a minute. Second thing, I think it's going to be great to develop big picture thinking. And I think it's, you know, if we don't get big picture thinking, such is the drama around us, we'll be sucked into absolutely captivating small picture thinking. And it's very hard to maintain that perspective uh, with the amount of change we're going. But it's a real opportunity to let your mind unpack itself from the habits of the past and even the perspectives and your deep held beliefs of the past and see whether you can start building new beliefs that are going to be unbelievably productive for your future. Now, I don't know if any of you have felt trapped in any way, either by your circumstances, by your thought, by the expectations, just by life around you, or by what we think is our own limits. You know, whether you sit in your imposter syndrome, which by the way, you should embrace as if it were a wonderful thing, because I do believe it is. Um, and you know, it tells you where you're working at the edge. And if you have felt like that, then maybe within all this is your chance really to, to blossom and thrive and to go into new directions, dangerous sort of this. So that's a big thing. Um, skilling up, building our own academy. You know, I'm a business school. You know, why would I be telling you to build your own academy? Well, I'll talk about that in a minute, but I think it's, it's important. And then understand what safety means. You know, we, we, I'm sure you're listening to a thousand and one people who are telling you to distance, to spray, to do this, to ventilate, you know, many things. And, and then the unbelievable number of people, for some reason, believe that it's a good idea not to wear masks. Now, the thing I always think about is that always makes sense at some level, whether it's like an alien logic to you, at some level, it makes sense to that person. It's always helpful to try and work out how that person can say that and why it makes sense to them to say that. Because only in that can one actually get to the heart of the problem. The fifth one is have substance in your voice and be activists. I'm, I'm gonna look forward to chatting to that briefly um, and I will chat for that. Um, and that's more about, you know, do we value what we say? And I don't mean being ponderous and full of gravitas and be deeply boring you know, and ever so self-important. It's not that at all. Substance is a different thing. Substance is grounded on something that matters to people. You know, it's real, you know, it, it helps. And being activist means that we don't get paralyzed by our own situation. If you want something to happen in the world, 
look behind you. There really isn't anywhere else to do it except you. Sorry. So, you know, have a go. Because in being activists are the seeds of greatness. And then find, embrace polarity and don't be bipolar. Now, I don't mean that in any way frivolous for people who suffer from bipolarity and, and, and have those issues. I have friends and relatives who do, but I don't mean it in that way at all. Um, what I mean is don't be bipolar in your thinking. And I was just playing on words there by you know, jumping one thing to another. And finally, be normal. It's fine. I'm going to go to, I'm going to, go to our Scandinavian friends there to address that one. So that's what I'm going to talk about for the next few minutes. And I will try and watch the chat and the questions. If you want to chuck some things in, I'll, I'll, I'll look out for that. Okay. So let's start on the first one, making reality your friend and, and getting off autopilot. Okay. And here we are. Um, now, there was a very famous CEO of what was South African breweries. And now it's part of ABI Inbev, a guy called Norman Adam. He always used to walk around saying, make reality your friend. Um, because I think we have a wonderful propensity to create fantasies. Yeah. In the absence of information, fantasy reigns. I don't think the human mind and society as a group, they go to the most logical and coherent solution. In the absence of information, we feel very adrift. And then things we can start believing in the wildest conspiracy theories. Yuval Noah Harari, who wrote Homo sapiens and and uh, Homo Deus and 21 Lessons for 21st Century, I think that's the end of the book. He talks about these meta-narratives. He says that people come together and get things done, not because of science, um, but of the stories, the narratives that hold them together. And he talks the narratives he would call capitalism a narrative. It's a belief system. He would call human rights a narrative. You can't touch it. Is it real? Yes, we all believe it's real, but where is it? He called communism that. He called religions the same. So no, no disrespect, but he would. And he says that the secret of humanity is that they coalesce. They, they can collaborate in millions because they have a story that brings them together. And you can see that playing out right now with the stories that people believe around the capital, um, around what's happening with the bifurcation, with the, the challenge of the left to the right and how we, we're living in a world where these things are going well. People believe in stories before they believe in science, I'm afraid. And so we need to understand that the story, what is the story we're following? And what is the reality? We don't want to live in fantasy. And, and being able to, um, being able to, I'll just go back one actually if I can, I'll just turn to that. Being able to live in reality is, is, is extremely difficult. Firstly, uh, we are conditioned by our upbringing to think the world around us. We, you know, we, we see the world as we are, not as it is. So if you are particularly conditioned or particularly trained or come from a particular background, I'm a middle class, late middle age, um, white Englishman who went to private schools and was a little time in the military um, from a colonial past, which was very subliminally racist, sexist, and classist. That is my foundation, if you like, early in my, my years. I wouldn't say that is me, but, I'm, but I'm, I really hope not. But it was very much the influence that molded some of my thinking without me even knowing about it when I was in my, you know, five, six, seven, eight years old in the schools. And it's not so later when you see that, that you've got the chance to unpack all that and liberate yourself from those sort of preconceptions. But while you're in those ways of thinking, you don't realize that that's not a logical construction. It's just a program. And it's really hard to unpack those and rather painful. So it's important to get off autopilot. Jung said there is no consciousness without conflict. I can assure you that if you don't want to be in your comfort zone and stuck in there and see the world as, you know, think reality is the way you see the world, then we, you are going to be taking some some strain. So bring some friends with you. And um, we have, I mean, I'm looking at Felix, uh, he's a wonderful guy, started off from corporate, uh, became sort of running parts of Henley in Germany, learned about coaching and reflection, and has gone completely different in this world. And I'm absolutely certain that Felix, your journey of getting off the autopilot and getting out the matrix you were in was a really tough one. Now, so bring some friends with you. Felix reached out, he makes friends, he builds up networks, he talks to people, he reflects, he gets people who co-reflect. 
an admirable, totally admirable, and has morphed himself into quite a different, I would argue, richer intellectually and richer in the impact he can have off life, you know, on life. So it's very easy, and especially when we're under such fear now. Um, and what I mean by getting off autopilot doesn't mean there's a tacking system and believing that the deep safe is out to get you. Maybe, for all I know, I don't believe that. But at least be skeptical. So you can be wildly optimistic, um, or you can be deeply cynical. And somewhere in between, there's this area of skepticism, healthy skepticism, where you look at things, you, you don't automatically deny them or think they're awful or think they're great, but you're just skeptical about them until you can get the handle, the handle of it. So I love this idea of making reality your friend, okay? So I think that's a, a kind of a cool idea. Let's look at the second one, um, and I've got a fair bit of time. I can come back to some of these. And this is what I think about big picture thinking. Now, I don't know about you, but when we think about big picture thinking, we often think as well, let's think strategically. There's something rather glorious and abstract, you know, hyper conceptual, and hyper strategic about big picture thinking. You know, and at, at its worst, it is, it is sort of abstract and theoretic and you know, just purely conceptual and not built in the world. Um, and at its best, it's a deeply systemic understanding of what's going on around us. Um, and in order to see, I think it was, who was it? I think there's that, there's that quote attributed to Einstein, we all know it, saying you can't solve a problem at the level of thinking that created it. So we're talking about here about transcending each level of thinking we're in. So we understand the world as this, like climate like international collaboration, like COVID, like all these things that are impacting us. Now, how do we solve this? And we, you know, we can all come up with our particular pet theory, but it's a complex world full of people who deeply disagree with me and probably you in many ways, and yet who in their own context feel they're very right. So how do you get to be a big picture thinking? So I did some research on this and I've come up with a little model, would you believe? And I'm gonna share this model as a sort of starting point for how you can train yourself to be a big picture thinking in a useful way. And I'm gonna call big picture thinking a set of capabilities that allow, you know, what I say, richer, more complex and nuanced insight and that elevates your analysis and therefore your actions and results. Now, we've got about 80, 90 people listening now. And any one of us, I'm sure, is any one of you is really clever. But you're going to see the world from your perspective. You know, here's the world. You're going to see it from here. Somebody else is going to see it from here. Each one of those people will have a, a different nuance on the truth. And imagine there was one brain sitting somewhere in cybersphere between us. And we were all connected to that brain with our own perspectives, our own insights into truth, the bits that I can't see. My historical Englishness or current Africanness might blind me to stuff. You know, that might give me a belief system. It might make it hard for me to see as you see. Imagine we could connect that brain to everybody sitting in front of us. And that brain was able to assimilate our insights and then looked at the world. I think you would probably agree that that brain would have a far better, deeper potential understanding of the patterns around us and will give us a much more, a much deeper, more realistic um, picture of the world. And if you use that brain to make a decision, it will probably get very highly leveraged decisions. It will be a rich insight, will probably give you a rich solutions that would have really good results. And that's what I'm saying here. How do you, how do you elevate? And, and getting that big picture thinking isn't an individualistic thing. It's quite, often, it's quite often a collective thing. Being able to think collectively gives you big picture thinking, although that's not really in the model. And, and it includes a few things. And as you can see, um, it's emotional control and reason, systemic habits of mind, which I'll talk about later, purpose beyond um, personal ambition. So let's look at those. Let's look at the one at the top there. There's a detachment and emotional control. So that's a really good one. So that's the one we're quite familiar with. You know, in order to be big picture thinking, we've got to think of the whole. You know, not little e empathy for the person in front of you, but big e empathy for the whole system. And as a humanity, when you're doing public health, you're not doing just individual health. You're, you're making decisions for the mass of people. And in that, some people might be losers and winners, but the whole collective, we hope, will be winners. 
So we need to have a certain detachment from emotional control and poise um, to reason, to see the big picture. This is a really hard thing to do. Um, maybe actually we don't have to, we might acknowledge our emotions, but we don't just follow our emotions. This is where we follow our values, where our values allow us to make decisions that our emotions might be screaming and telling us I want to do X, Y, and Z. And this is where all those ethical dilemmas lie. So understanding building detachment emotional control is really, really important. And it might seem cold sometimes, but it's critically important to be able to do that. Um, but it's not unhuman because what we're trying to do, as you'll see from Western models, is build a better humanity. And the second one on the right is really important to be good at systemic thinking, working to understand not just the part, but understand how those things work together. We often look at this or that, but the, the relationship, how one affects the other, we often don't really look at. And systemic thinking, you look at a number of objects, but you see systemically how they influence each other. And this one goes up, how does that one go down? And we look at this sort of rich pattern of behaviors and we try and work out what are the nodal points that we can influence so we get a very different thing. So understand our systemic thinking is very learnable. We don't teach it in schools, bizarrely. I think now people do. Um, now, here's, the third one, so while we're detached on one level and we're being analytical, at the bottom level, you cannot have that big picture thinking without the possibility of visualizing and imagining. Can you imagine not being a big picture thinking without the capacity to imagine? And if you're looking and feeling yourself what that's like, surely I would say perhaps that that's a very different characteristic to imagine You've got to go into a completely unknown, almost fantastical world and try and think out what the future could be. And again, I, I don't know how you feel about this, but I really feel that imagination and visualization are learnable skills. The more you do it, the better you get at it. Um, so how big picture thinking make reality your friend is that, um, so tomorrow's future you know, tomorrow's, tomorrow's reality is today's imagination. And the future didn't just arrive. If you can't visualize a future, how can you create it? Uh, the futures we create are not just randomly assembled. People visualize and drive them in multiple ways. So I think that, um, you know, reality of friend is very, very close because I think, you know, we can build new realities, beautiful, big reality. Think of the Elon Musk. What, what took a you know, a bullied schoolboy from Pretoria School who went to America to become the person who is setting up colonies on Mars. Tell me he doesn't have the visualization imagination to see that. So, and then he makes that reality happen. So it's a interesting thing. So you, we can't, I'll talk about the bipolarity. And finally, it's really, really important is this idea that all this stuff is fine unless you've really got a sense of purpose and a vision beyond the individual. What is bigger than me that we're trying to do? And right now in the pandemic and with our climate challenges we're having and with the change in nature of capitalism, the businesses of countries we're facing, we've got to think about more than just us because we are interdependent. And how can we make these futures happen unless we can start to think of a purpose that we and others resonate with? And that allows a big picture thinking to move into action. Now I could talk about this for a long, long time. So let's go to the next one. We can, we can cover this in another one if you want to. So here, point three. So um, here I am, the business school. I'm telling you to don't necessarily come to business school. You know, we have so many options now to, to build your own future, to understand things, that um, you should build your own academy. Now, accredited programs at business schools are normally quite, quite often they're accredited because people have worked in them. There's good knowledge within them. It's very substantial. But somebody had to accredit them and so back to the academy thing if you want to build your own academy you can you can go onto udemy you can go on to read books you can go to coursera go on to linkedin the idea is we're living a life now courses are very predictable and they're not also they're not particularly at the bleeding edge of change so if you can't do an mba this year if you want to just keep yourself learning be very proactive about picking out sources of learning from all over build a group think of our lives i think going forward in 2021 it's a learning life we have to find ways we're in a change so the historic courses and programs <coughs> that you're thinking that won't be won't be ready to actually um talk about necessarily the sort of scale of change we're going through so look in different ways 
Okay. Um, the next one I'd say is understand safety. And I think this is really important. This is where I needed a better slide. So I'm afraid this may not show very well, but let's have a look. So safety thinking is about everybody's safety and not about one, one, one person at all. And it's actually surprisingly difficult to do. Um, it's all about system thinking at the end of the day. I'll tell you a story. Uh, you can see that whole slide there. That should build on a presentation. It doesn't matter. <coughs> I was chairman of a school, and there was a, there was a class of five-year-olds on the first floor with the stairs going up to it. Below it was a concrete about two meters down. And uh, one day, of course, a little kid fell from the, the first floor onto the concrete, survived, but hurt, that, hurt her head quite well, unfortunately, but, but recovered completely. And everybody said, what do we do? First, we put a net underneath it. And then everyone started saying, well, what were the teachers? And then at the end of it, everyone said, oh, we always knew that was going to happen. Well, let's look at how you manage safety. We have to understand that we've got causes and symptoms. If you have a headache, you take a, a panado or an aspirin or an ibuprofen or something. But it might be a lifestyle. It might be an underlying disease. You don't know what's causing it. So often there are multiple from multiple events. And the first level of safety is we react to them. Reacting to them, like putting up a safety net, is not particularly effective, not particularly helpful um, when you're trying to get rid of the problem. It does solve some of the symptoms, but yet on the right here, you'll see this leverage. You're using quite a lot, it's not very high leverage. You're using quite a lot of effort to move very little things. Once you understand the patterns, okay, that teacher's at between five past 10 and half past 10, the teacher go into another room or there's a change of shift or that's the time they have a tea break and they take, and you've only got one teacher in the room for that period. Well, you know that is a pattern that there was more, less, less eyes on the problem, more likely to see it. So you're starting to see, first you have to see patterns. We had a, um, a township near us that would have uh, plenty of fires. And so you used to send the fire engine, take half an hour to get there, put out the fire to go back to the engine. And the pattern was that on Friday and Saturday nights, everyone you know, had fires. So they put the fire engine right there on a Friday and Saturday night. But that didn't get rid of the fires. The reason there were fires is poverty, people were drinking too much, unlicensed drinking places, stoves that fell over when people are drinking, lots of sort of fights and excitement on, on Friday and Saturday nights. So it's in order to prevent that, we set up neighborhood watch, we trained up the um, we trained up the um, the shabins, we gave them licenses, we had we gave people stoves that didn't fall over. And by getting rid of the underlying structures, you got rid of the fires in the first place. And they built a fire engine by there, and the fire station, you didn't need it by the time everyone moved on. So if you want to understand safety, you understand, you've got to understand that the multitude of symptoms don't indicate the underlying structures. We know with COVID, for example, we know very well. You know, we have to um, obviously sanitize. You know? We have to obviously wear masks so we don't infect other people. We obviously have to distance. You know, and we obviously have to avoid crowded places. Well, it turns out that one of the most important causes of COVID, according to um, CDC and World Health Organization, of them, is aerosols, aerosolized communication. So those things that we're doing are quite helpful, but it would be better actually in the rooms we're having is to have massively effective um, ventilation because by, tape, by sucking the virus out so it never reaches the density that can drift across the room, you actually hold a very safe environment. And, and actually removing a virus, it's, it's getting removing the virus from the environment makes it a lot safer in the first place. Um, especially when you've got more you know, difficult and more infectious varieties. So we do need to have all those disciplines, but we've got to think about what are the underlying structures and mindsets. And one of the most dangerous mindsets in COVID, of course, is this individualistic sense that you know, my individual freedoms are, uh, are impugned by, 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 not by having to wear masks and being told what to do. Therefore, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. But COVID is a, is a perfect example of something that can only really be solved communally by working at the underlying drivers. And when you start thinking in this way, you start understanding that once you've understood the fundamental drivers, it doesn't take much, it's the same amount of effort here to move a huge amount, have a huge amount of impact as it did to solve these individual symptoms. And that's where we need big picture thinking, systemic thinking, so if you want to get good in 2021 in this wild world, think big picture, understand systemic thinking, really take safety management seriously, not necessarily for safety management, but the disciplines of thinking it gives you. Okay. Um, I'm going to move to the next slide now, because I was coming at that point five. 
and this is one thing I'm really strong about, have substance in our voices. Now we only have one voice and it's good for joking and it's fantastic to joke. It needs it for humor, it's needed for loving, it's needed for analytic, it's needed for speech, it's needed for communication. But in the end of the idea, you've only got the one voice and people only hear you in one way in your life. So why make yourself insubstantial? Now I don't, I don't mean being ponderous and you know, being a very oh, ever so theoretical and distant serious person. I'm saying have substance. Have so, when you're saying something, say something that matters. And I don't, you know, having a joke matters in the right, in the right circumstances. Being clever at communication, lifting the mood matters. But understand what it is you're trying to do. Don't undermine yourself or the seriousness and importance of reality you face by trivializing it and infantilizing. You know, use this. You, it's you. That's who you are. You know, once we realize that, it, that you might feel like an imposter when you put substance into your voice. When you start talking about big issues, who am I to talk about these things? All these important people. But you know, you are you, and you know what? It matters. The more people who start to talk about things in ways that are, you know, and I don't mean substance in way of arguing, you know, come up with things that are really interesting to think about and make people think. Um, and you will find that you will, people will thank you for that most of the time, as long as that is linked to being activist. Because if you are not activists in this, if you decide, that you just want to be, you know, be a philosopher. We're not in a world where philosophers can necessarily help much at the moment. Substance implies self-care, self-respect, self-knowledge, understanding who you are. People will resonate more with you when you say, I was brought up a racist and didn't know it, if you were, obviously. And I've been spending 50 years unpacking that. And it's been one of the most joyous journeys in my life to get that freedom from those the viruses of the mind um, in this long, ongoing journey. So be re and have a respect for results and completing things. And having substance means from speaking a stance of human equality, not from being a lesser person or a victim or being greater. It's not about narcissism or being a victim. It's just looking people straight in the eyes and seeing the common humanity, even though we're very different in so many ways. The other thing about having substance, impact, and a voice, the difference in speech and a voice, a voice goes somewhere, a voice forces and encourages people to deal with the, with the difficult big challenges that if we solve, make life better. So have initiative and capacity to act when, when outcomes are uncertain. You know, we never know what's gonna happen and, and you'll never get certainty. There's never a right time for many things. We have to get used to acting in uncertainty. And there's interesting research that says that, you know, that the majority of executive decisions are wrong um, but in spite of that, it's better to act fast and slowly. As a rule, it's not always the case, of course. And the reason is that when we get into action, we start to see un unperceived issues of a problem. And that allows us to see a much richer picture and we can adapt very quickly. And so when you're acting and you're good at adapting, then you can move. Um, the next one down is a proper selfishness. And that's that idea that comes from Charles Handy. Some of you might remember him. This idea of self-care, the idea of the oxygen mask in the airplane, take it for you first, because how can you help people? Um, and yeah, having boundaries, respect for self and others. And I know we have this and we say this, but it's, it's very important that we do this communally as well. We help each other and we recognize that in each other. And finally, taking ownership of end results. If we are not getting things done and we don't take accountability for the end things we get wrong, because we're gonna learn from that, and then how can you have substance? How can you have substance if you're just talking around things? Why would you take that person seriously? No, you've got to suffer the pain of your actions. You've got to take the consequences of your mistakes and you've got to learn through them. Um, in fact, I was reading about the new, um, the, the, uh, the politician who's taken over from Angela Merkel probably saying that, um, that was fascinating, I don't know him, but he was saying he's had a life of continual non-achievement, not quite getting there but just have one capacity that is never giving up and always carrying on and somehow always smiling and dressing up in funny clown costumes in these, in these festivals. Now he sounds like a pretty interesting person. So stop shouting and do something useful. Embrace optimism in the face of fear of suffering. We, we know we're gonna have fear. We know we're gonna suffer. We know people unfortunately gonna die um, and, and that's the consequence of what we do. But you cannot say that life is not worth living because of that. Those are, the hard consequences of life. We've got to be positive and continue throughout those. 
Viktor Frankl, you would know from his book, uh, so in, in Search of Meaning, talked a lot about this idea of tragic optimism. I, I suggest you embrace that. Now, polarity. So in the last, I've got a few more minutes, so I've got two more slides, so two more points. The idea of polarities. And, and for this, I'm going to ask you to do something, right? First, right, just, I don't know if you are going to do it. I have no idea if you're all over the place, but let's try. So breathe out and don't breathe in. Now breathe in and don't breathe out. I can do that now. So which is better, breathing in or breathing out? Who's a breather in -er? Let's see the breather in -er. Who's a breather in -er? Who thinks breathing in is best? Okay, you can say in the chat or wave a hand or something. And who thinks breathing out is best? And obviously, you've got to have both, haven't you? So it's like this. So when you breathe in, you know, at some point, you you breathe in, you you get oxygen, okay? Okay, it comes this way. You get oxygen, but after a while, the oxygen is processed in your body, and you've got too much carbon dioxide, okay? You've got to get rid of it, okay? So you blow out and clean out the carbon dioxide. But while the downside of breathing out is you start to suffer from too little oxygen. Oh my goodness. So let's get the upside. So you charge and let's get some oxygen. Yes. But the downside of that is after a while you get too much carbon dioxide. So you've got to breathe out. So life is a dynamic balance between these two things. Which is better, structure or freedom? Which is better, organization? or imagination. I don't know what the, what the alternative is. <coughs> so obviously there are benefits of structure. Okay, if you put structure here, there are lots of benefits of structure. But you, if you have structure without freedom and innovation, you start to get the downside of structure, which is it becomes bureaucratic and negative and boring and doesn't do anything new. And so everybody in the organization starts screaming, we want innovation. That's what a consultant, let's have innovation. Get a bunch of innovation consultants, everyone gets the upside. Wow, it's exciting. We've got innovation, we've got new revenue, it's brilliant. But if you innovate without structure, you start to move towards chaos and anarchy. Okay, and then you get the downside of innovation, which is lack of structure. Everything nobody knows what's going on. And everyone in the organization said, let's get the structure consultants in. And we call them in and they give us the structure. And, oh, we feel better now. So obviously, life is a continual dance between these things. And the secret is to keep the dance up here. You know, keep the dance up here. We don't want to be locked in our houses forever in total fear, but we don't want to be stuck together all the time where, where everyone's being random. So you've got to have, yes, you've got to be distancing, but we've got to find ways and that we can actually keep ourselves engaged, keep our intellects engaged as well. So this is an idea of polarity management from a chap called, um, what is his name? Get back to you. Get back to you on that. How could I forget that? Um, it'll come back to you for the end of the show. Um, and the idea is use this sense that, that we, and the thing about if you're a breather inner and you love oxygen and, and you're dealing with a breather outer who loves cleaning out carbon dioxide, and that person says, Oh, I love cleaning out carbon dioxide, you'll say, Oh, no, but then you get too little oxygen. If you sit in this box, you won't see the upside of this, you'll only see the downside. If you're a breather outer, you'll never see the upside of breathing in. You'll see all the downsides of breathing in. Oh, you know, you get too much. Yeah. And, and this is what happens in the arguments. People don't see the positive side. They only see the negative side because you hold to your position. So this is what I think will be a good thing to do in 2021 is stop being bipolar. And finally, be normal. And for this, when I say normal, it's okay to be average. It's okay to be, and, and you're going to hate me for this, I'm sure. It's okay. <coughs> Being ordinary is good enough most of the time. In fact, it's our desperate urge to be abnormal, super normal. This, this almost desperate feeling that 
who we are as human beings, as, as we stand, is not good enough. We've got to be so, no, we have everything from where we are. As we are is good enough. We've just got to practice things so that we start doing wonderful things and better things. The basis of being normal is fine. In fact, though, now let's go to Denmark for a moment. They have something called Yanti's Law, which I mean, is, I think means John. And it's a Nordic code of conduct focused on the importance of appreciating the wisdom of a group, the global mind. And it's based in individual respect. It's a sort of anti-narcissism. And it's one of the reasons people say that Denmark is so happy. And the 10 rules state, and they're slightly tongue in cheek, but we'll think about them. You're not to think that you are anything special. And this is compared with the group. You know, if you think, if you come to a group and say, I'm special in the group, what about the rest? Are they not special? So actually, we're all good enough. And by working within the group, respectfully, um, being normal, we start to get wonderful outcomes. You're not to think you are as good as we are. Now, you are part of the group. So, you know, I separately am better than all that team. No, don't think about that. Together, we can do this. You are not to think that you are smarter than we are. And so you start to see not to imagine yourself better than we are. So a lot of people, if you think you're so supremely gifted and so wonderful, everyone's got a cow to you. You've only got your narrow perspective. So if you want to solve really big problems in the world of 2021, start to be ordinary and respect the positive. Now, of course, there are negative aspects of the group when you get crazy cults and conspiracy theories. But if you practice all these disciplines, you'll probably avoid that. And you'll keep yourself relatively sane. You're not more, more important than we are. You are good at anything. We are good at the whole lot. You're not to, you are not to laugh at us. It's all very nice. You're othering, you're outsidering the group. You know, be, be part of it. Don't other people. Don't make them two-dimensional or nothing. You know, we're all humans. Um, and you're not to think anyone cares about you specifically. Of course they do. People desperately care about you. But together we can care about big things, have a big picture. And don't think that you alone can teach us anything. Together we can teach ourselves a huge amount. So this is a fascinating concept of Yanti's law. And I think, for me, those are the seven characteristics which I think may or may not help us in 2021. I really thank you so much for listening.